Pledge by digits. Thank you very much. I think you all know about digits. So. <laughs> Thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this wonderful conference so far, and I look forward to the remainder of the conference. So, um, before I get to digits, I have a few other things to say. So, uh, Hendrik and I first met, we confirmed this earlier at lunch, uh, about 44 years ago uh, at a conference at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, organized by Paula Ribbonborn. And we discussed a, a math problem there that I've been interested in over many years. Um, here's a, a theorem that we all know from elementary number theory that uh, due to Euler and I suppose Dirichlet, that if you take an integer a that's not a square, and you look at the primes p with a to the p minus one over two, probably to one mod p, so those primes have density one half within the primes. Namely, by Euler's criterion, these are the, these are the, um, <laughs> I turned my phone on airplane mode, and apparently that wasn't enough. <laughs> anyway, um, this by Euler's criterion, it says that A is a quadratic residue, and then by Dirichlet, we we know how to compute the density of each residue from um, mod P. So. Um, the problem is this. So we we want to generalize from the integers mod a prime to the integers mod n. And playing the role of p minus 1 is lambda of n. That's Carl Michael's lambda function. This is the exponent of the group. And so the question is, for a fixed a, what can you say about the integers n that are co-prime to a, which a to the lambda of n over 2 is 1 mod n? So, um, repeat the, the question here at the top. <coughs> and perhaps, well, the density of integers relatively applied to A is phi of A over A, is Euler's function. So you might think it's it's a half of that. Instead, uh, Hendrik and I came up with the heuristic that for most values of A, the density of such N does not exist. Um, Though in some easily proved cases it does exist, and the density is phi of a over a. So, for example, an ex a case where it's phi of a over a is when a is two. Um, when a is two, uh, an integer, an odd integer n, is almost surely divisible by a prime of one on eight, and uh, this then governs um, situation. So we can see this over here in this next part. The power of two and lambda of n. It's so someone just said the power the power of two and lambda of n is is governed by the maximal power of two in the shifted primes p minus one to p dividing n. So if, if m is the multiplicative order of a mod n. And the power of two in that order is equal to the full power of two in lambda of n, if and only if um, a is a quadratic non residue. The two times p dividing n for the power of two and p minus one is the same as for where the maximum occurs. So that's, that's the condition that decides whether or not this congruence should hold. If A is a quadratic residue for every such prime P with this happening, then this will occur. And if at least one of these is minus one, then this won't occur. So the issue boils down to whether the maximum occurs for a single prime P, two primes, three primes, et cetera. And so what, um, we argued is that if the um, 
that this depends on how close the number of primes p and n is to a power of two. But wait a minute, the number of primes p dividing n, we know from Hardy and Ramanujan, is usually near log log n. So as n goes off to infinity, log log n can sometimes be equal to, a, or almost equal to a power of two, very close to a power of two. And other times it could be like midway between two consecutive powers of two, and that creates the oscillation. With a former student, Shu Guang Li, we uh, used these thoughts uh, to show that an analog of Artin's conjecture uh, has oscillations. So the analog is uh, for a fixed A odd N, how often is its order equal to the maximal order lambda N? Density of such ends uh, oscillates. In fact, always uh, uh, zero is the lower oscillation point. And on the generalized Riemann hypothesis, it's positive. So it's pleasant to recall these old problems, and I'm not going to talk further about them. And as we know, Hendrick is famous for his algorithms. So um, here are some records held by Hendrick. Okay. You can ask for a smoothness test for an individual number. Given a big number, how is it smooth or not? Well, you've got to factor it. Well, what's the best factoring algorithm if the number is wants to be smooth? And that's Hendrick's elliptic curve method. Um, now that's not that's a heuristic method. If you want to the fastest rigorous smoothness test, this uh, is in a paper, a few papers that I have with Hendrick and Jonathan uh, Pila, and it's inspired by work of Abelman and Ming De Huang, who uh, and invented this method as a primality test. So basically, what it uses is Jacobian varieties of hyperelliptic curves of genus two instead of elliptic curves. Okay, we all know about the uh, polynomial time factoring method for primitive polynomials over the integers due to Hendrick with his brother Aryan and with Lotsi Lovas. In that paper, they also have the famous LLL algorithm. The, um, the fastest practical integer factoring algorithm uh, for general numbers is the general number field sieve with uh, Hendrick and um, me and Joe Bueller, and inspired by work of John Pollard, Adelman, and Kuvain. And others. Okay, the fastest rigorous factoring that's class groups method. Hendrick and me after work of Dr. Zeisen, Harry Lester. The fastest deterministic primality test. Um, inspired by work of for a while, Kyle and Sector, me and Hendrick. Okay, not enough records. Um, maybe there are other records. I just, those, those are the six that jumped to my mind. But maybe there are others. Um, for uh, more on this, uh, you should read an article by Arian about factoring, and uh, which you can find online. And improvements on the AKS primality test. You can see our paper or the survey of Andrew Granville for my book with, with uh, Crandall. So um, I could have, you know, spoke about all these things, but instead I'm just going to talk about digits. And um, I, I'm a little embarrassed. Maybe I'm setting a bad example for people to uh, just do fun things, but um, uh, I'm retired. <laughs> I, don't, I don't apply for grants anymore. Um, I don't have to justify anything. And uh, lots more fun with problems about digits. In fact, um, here's Hendrick, I think, moving of his uh, plan. <laughs> he has, has a very interesting mini lecture that he can play mm -hmm. a trick on the audience magic trick <laughs> red numbers 
which has to do with uh, digits and maybe you can get him to, uh, to tell you about that at some point. So here's a, a survey of what I'm gonna talking about, various um, topics dealing with digits. And uh, most of these uh, shouldn't make much sense at this point. Um, so let, let's just uh, jump into it. Um, this is an obscure paper. <laughs> One of the first papers I published. Um, I won't read the title, but you <laughs> I'd only been at the University of Georgia a couple of years when I, when I wrote this. So what is this interesting property of this huge number? Apparently, if you multiply it by 99, I don't know why you would do that, but if you multiply it by 99, you get essentially the same number over again with a one in the front and a one in the back. So um, and it's the smallest number with that property. So uh, my colleague, John Hunsucker and I, we wondered, uh, well, we figured this out that that was the least number. And we wondered um, how special is this for the base 10? Now you have to, ge to generalize to other bases, um, the number 99, if it's in base B, uh, should be B squared minus one. So you have a number in base B, multiply it by B squared minus one, and that just tacks on a one at the beginning and a one at the end. We gave a criterion for this to happen, and we proved that the numbers that satisfy this criterion have absolute uh, um, asymptotic density zero. So almost no numbers have this property. Um, next up, uh, we you could ask, um, okay, almost no bases have this property. Are there infinitely base many bases that do have the property? And we couldn't prove it. So that's an unsolved problem. Prove that there are infinitely many bases B with this so-called interesting property. And um, <laughs> we, we, we were able to prove that if, um, that if there's a number that's three mod four X, plus that X squared minus X minus one is, is prime, then there is a corresponding base. Okay, so um, you can look up our paper. And if you write the paper and cite us, that'll be the first citation that paper's ever had. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next topic up, Niven numbers. And, um, there actually are some papers in the literature about Niven numbers. Niven refers to someone you might have heard of, Ivan Niven, who was a co-author of the famous book of Niven and Zuckerman. So the story goes that um, in 1977, there was a, con a sort of a math edge conference in Southern Ohio at Miami University of Ohio. And Paul Erdish was at this conference and he, um, he needed people around him to talk about his con conjectures and so on. And maybe he, he had used up uh, the people there at this conference. And he, 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 prevailed upon the conference organizers to have me come up to, to talk to him. So I did, I came up and, and talked to Erdish. And one of the people at the conference was Ivan Niven. And he gave a talk about how a mathematician might read the, the Sunday comics in the newspaper. Uh, the young people, newspapers are these things that... <laughs> um, okay, so it was this... Game for kids. Um, find a two digit number divisible by the sum of its digits. And it wasn't even two digits, it was between 10 and 20. Find a number between 10 and 20 divisible by the sum of its digits. And even leaving out 10 and 20 itself. <laughs> the problem is absolutely trivial. But, um, now, when a mathematician wouldn't stop by saying it's absolutely trivial, they, they generalize to other bases, for example. Right? <laughs> For the distribution of such numbers and not restricting to the interval 10 to 20. So um, I thought that we should be able to prove that these Niven numbers, say numbers divisible by the sum of their digits in the base 10, that those numbers, that's a rare occurrence. 
numbers shouldn't usually be divisible by the sum of the stitches. These numbers should have asymptotic density zero. But I, I didn't really know how to prove it. And Erdős, I mentioned it to him. He didn't know how to prove it either. But I guess he didn't think very hard because it turns out that it has a, a fairly simple solution. Um, I was at a conference at the University of Texas and, and uh, Curtis Cooper, uh, who was at Niven's lecture, uh, was there and he had written something with his colleague Robert Kennedy about uh, these Niven numbers, but uh, they couldn't prove the density zero either. And it just occurred to me that it was the simple proof. And I saw Robert, you're shaking your head, so you probably know the the simple proof. So it's written here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the idea is this: look at numbers with k digits. Now, um, what can you say about the sum of the digits? Well, it could be anything from very small to to all nines, but most of the numbers, there's sort of a central limit theorem going on. Most of the numbers have a, about four and a half times k digits, close to that. k is large. Four and a half is the average from zero to nine. So um, you can ask the simpler question, how many numbers are divisible in such an interval between one minus 4.5 minus epsilon times k, and 4.5 plus epsilon times k. So just take the sum of the reciprocals of the numbers in that interval, and that's big O of epsilon. So there are not many numbers, and that's a proof. So I told this proof to uh, Cooper and Kennedy, and they ended up publishing it, thanking me. So, oh, that's but that's okay, because the bigger issue was, what is the asymptotic density? Now, it should be some constant times x over log x, because the sum of the digits is of a number near x should be near log x. And so the chance that it should divide should be like constant over log x. And so this uh, I later proved in a joint paper with Modui and Sharkozy. And it turned out that another trio proved the same theorem with a slightly weaker error bound. This is de Konak, Boyon, and Okay, that's it for Niven numbers. We, you know, these papers also generalize to other bases. Okay, my former student, Paul Pollock, and collaborators have been looking recently at Benford's law. This is a, a principle from statistics. So if you look at, um, for example, take, take a, a list of all of the uh, towns in Scotland and um, what their populations are. So these are some list of maybe random numbers, but you'll find that the leading digits of these numbers are more likely to be one than any other digit. And two is the next most common and so on. So this, this has to do with the fact that the, the logarithms of these numbers are uniformly distributed. And that sort of explains the predominance of one. It's the base 10 logarithm of two. That's the proportion of times you see a one. It's known as Benford's law. So to make this number theory, you could take a, an arithmetic function like Euler's phi function and ask how often uh, do, do the numbers phi of n as n varies, do they follow Benford's law? And Pollock and his collaborators no, they don't. But very recently, he said that for lambda of n, the Carmichael lambda function that we saw earlier, it does follow Benford's law. So this is somewhat unexpected. Hmm. Here's a problem that might bring you some money to solve it. Uh, it's due to Ron Graham, and he offered a thousand dollars for, oof, but he's passed away, so I'm not sure how. It, how um, the $1,000 is still in operation. But anyway, it's a nice problem. Anyway, and here's, here's what it is. You look at the um, binomial coefficient, 2n choose n, and you ask how often is that um, relatively prime to 105? In fact, it does it happen infinitely often. Now, um, why 105? 
Well, it's the least number that's divisible by three odd primes. And that's the significance of 105 here. And um, for a prime P, you could ask, what is its, how often does it divide two n choose n? Well, there's a elementary theorem that says that if you add n to itself in the base P, then P will divide if, uh, depending on the number of carries there are in that. So if there's one carry that it appears to the first power, if there are two carries, it appears to the second power and so on. And you can see why the number two is left out because if I add n to itself in base two, there's going to be at least one carry. So two will always divide two n choose n for every n starting at one. But that's not true. So three won't divide if there are no carries in base three, and that means n is only the digits zero and one, and base five only the digits zero, one, and two, and base seven only the digits zero, one, two, and three. And um, a, you can ask about each of these separately, What's the distribution? And you could then argue heuristically that these are independent events. The number in base three is an independent event from base five. Um, and so uh, that type of argument, there should be a small power of X of them up to X. But we don't know that there are infinitely many. That's the problem, proof that there are infinitely many. There was a conference last fall in Montreal Henry Granville's 60th birthday. And uh, Ernie Crude, a former student of Granville's, gave a talk where he outlined a possible way to attack this problem. I don't think we solved it yet. So, it used to be this covering conjecture of Erdős. In fact, I think I first heard this conjecture when I was a graduate student and on my thesis committee was John Coates. And um, he could tell I wasn't cut out to be the algebraic geometry type of person at, at Harvard. So he said, there's this guy going around with this problem. He was talking about Erdős, um, <laughs> offering uh, $20 for us, like Erdős used to do. So here, here's the problem. Um, you have distinct moduli, M1, M2, Mk. They're all bigger than some bound B. And for each modulus, you have a residue class. And we would like the union of these residue classes to be all of the integers. So if you don't put in the restriction that the moduli are distinct, it's easy. So for example, I could take um, zero mod two and one mod two. The union of those two classes is all the integers. If I don't put in the lower bound restriction, the problem is also trivial because um, I could just take zero mod one and that's all of the integers. But if I put in B equal two, you have to work a little bit to find an example. You can find, for example, zero mod two, zero mod three, um, one mod four, one mod six and 11 mod 12, that works. Okay, but as B gets larger, it gets harder and harder to do this. And the record I believe now is, is B equals 42. So in the late nineties, I was thinking about this problem and I asked an, myself an easier question. Instead of covering all of the integers, take every modulus in the interval from B to 2B and then use those to, to sieve out as much as you can of all of the integers. And what is the proportion of numbers left? You obviously can't get everything covered because the sum of the reciprocals of all the numbers between B and 2B is about the natural log of two, which is smaller than one. And so you won't get everything. So would it be log two for the density of what's left? Well, if they were independent events for these integers between B and 2B, and the density would be a half. You look at product one minus one over N is N 
rangers over that interval, it would be telescoping down to one half. So the answer would be somewhere between one half and log two. So what is it? So I discussed this problem with a grad student of mine at the time at Georgia named Dang Yu. He later took a job at South Carolina where he discussed this problem with Villaseta and Ford. And later, Sergei Konyagin came on board. And the five of us proved, among other things, that the density is more like as if they were pairwise co prime. The, density, the best you can do asymptotically is log two. Um, we used um, a lemma in our paper that we invented ourselves, but the referee pointed out to us was very similar to uh, the Lovas local lemma on the torx. And a few years later, Robert Puff used um, a stronger version of our lemma to disprove Erdős's conjecture. He showed that if B is sufficiently large, then one cannot cover the integers with um, a finite collection of distinct moduli. Well, what does this have to do with digits? Well, this work, yes. Your question, can, can you say anything about what sufficiently large means? Is that explicit? We, we did have a bound, but it wasn't anywhere near 42. It was probably in the millions or something like that. And I think it's been lowered since um, uh, Pace Nielsen has worked on, on this with, with Huff and gotten it down lower. It was Pace and his uh, student at Brigham Young that brought it up to 42 from the, from the bottom. So uh, Nielsen has been interested in this problem for many years. So this has nothing to do with digits, or does it? Because it turns out that these, um, these covering congruences became very useful in another problem. Here's a picture of Michael Pulisetta. And you could wonder what, um, why I mentioned what's on his t-shirt. These are all prime numbers and in the, written in the base 10. And they are digitally delicate. It's a little difficult to say fast. Um, what does it mean to be di digitally delicate? It means if you take any digit in, in one of these primes and change it to another digit, it'll no longer be prime. So as an example, let's, let's look at this very first one, uh, 294,001. Now change that one to a zero. Uh, <laughs> it's composite. Well, it, I could have changed it to a three. It would be composite. I could have changed the leading two to a one. It would be composite. Change, change the leading two to a six. It would be composite. They're digitally delicate. So the question is, um, are there infinitely many of these? And these covering congruences were used to prove, yes, that they are. In fact, there's even something called widely digitally delicate, which is um, harder, even harder to say. Some of the history of this, um, Cohen and Selfridge proved in the mid 70s that there are a positive proportion of digitally delicate primes too, and Ji Wei Sun gave another proof in 2000. Um, so, um, Terry Tao <laughs> that in any base, a positive proportion of the primes are digitally delicate. Um, now, what is widely di digitally delicate? That means that you can think of a number as having infinitely many digits because. Before the number, there's an infinite string of zeros. And if you changed any one of those zeros to some other digit, it would become composite. So, Phil um, and his uh, colleagues uh, proved that, in fact, the positive proportion of primes are widely digitally delicate in base 10. He didn't have a single example. He just proved that there was a positive proportion. Um, John Grantham, a former student who's here, he actually constructed such a widely digitally delicate prime with over 4,000 digits, not counting the infinite string. Of the 
In fact, there are arbitrarily long strings of consecutive primes that are based in widely digitally delicate. Unbelievable. Okay. It's an, here's an unsolved problem. Um, and you've proved that there are infinitely many primes that are not digitally delicate or even not widely digitally delicate. And the answer is obviously yes. For example, take, take any, take a pair of twin primes uh, where the lower one ends with one, like 11, 13 or 101, 103. The smaller one is not digitally delicate, nor is the larger one. So um, that doesn't have to be the only way. Okay, talking about digits of primes. Must all large primes contain every digit? Obviously, I have to say the word large there. Like, take, take your favorite prime, 17. Okay. Well, it's only two, digit, two digits, can't contain everything. But there are only finitely many primes, <coughs> bounded number of digits. Oh, but infinity, primes have lots and lots of digits. Must they contain every digit? If you looked at base two, in base two, there could be primes with only ones. These are known as Mersenne primes. It's not known if there are infinitely many or not. Presumably there are, but obviously for most primes in base two, they are not Mersenne primes and um, they do contain every base two digit. What about base 10? But just a few years ago, um, James Maynard proved that for any, pick any base 10 digit you'd like, A, for infinitely many primes in their decimal expansion that do not have an A in them. And the proportion of such primes is um, similar to taking the proportion of integers that don't have A near X and dividing that by log X. So he, um, this proof, it was, not a, it was not a recreational math type proof. It was a very difficult proof he used the Hardy Littlewood circle method. Um, and skillfully. And he also um, go to uh, if you wanted K digits that are missing, that are just one. You can do it if the base B is sufficiently large. Uh, Granville wrote a lecture, uh, wrote up a lecture about this that was given last January at the joint math <laughs> meetings in Boston. Found online. By the way, finding online the slides are put on my homepage. So if you're interested in copying down Granville's lecture, you can find it there. So this brings us, of course, to the TV show, The Big Bang Theory. People are familiar with this. Um, going back to, to Hendrick. Um, so this is a, supposed to be a birthday conference. Hendrick's birthday is not till next week. 16th. And I'm, I'm going to capitalize on the fact that this week, Hendrick is not 74, he's 73. <laughs> so here's some um, dialogue from this, from this show. Belden, who's the lead character on the Bank Theory, says, what is the best number? By the way, there's only one correct answer. Raj, <laughs> another character says, 5,318,008. And then Sheldon says, wrong. <laughs> Best number is 73. You're probably wondering why. Other characters. Oh, uh -uh, we're good. <laughs> and Sheldon says, 73 is the 21st prime number. It's mirror, 37, is the 12th prime number. And it's mirror, uh, and it's mirror, 21. Multiple, 
that I like. It's the best number. So Leonard says, we get it. 73 is the Chuck Norris of numbers. Sheldon says, Chuck yeah. Norris wishes in binary, 73 is a palindrome, 100101. Which backwards is one zero zero one zero zero one. That's in case the audience didn't know what a palindrome is. <laughs> exactly the same. Old Chuck Norris backwards gets you. You're on cook. <laughs> so here's a photo from the show. Sheldon wearing his '73 uh, T-shirt, which is on several of the shows. And you you can find it online to buy it. For, um, <laughs> so, um, about five years ago, a fellow named Chris Spicer and I proved what we call the Shelton Conjecture. <laughs> that 73 really was unique. <laughs> so, what, let's, let's go over what these properties are again. So, it's a prime number. It is the nth prime, where uh, n is the product of the digits of the function, or the product property. 73 is the 21st prime, and 7 times 3 is 21. Then, if one reverses the digits of the prime, we get let's say it's 37. One looking at the prime that is, that's the mth prime. m is the reverse of n. So, the, uh, 12 is the reverse of 21. It's the, the mirror prime. So we're supposed to prove that 73, the unique prime with these two properties. Now, note that just the, the very first property shows that it's a finite problem. There are not infinitely many candidates. And why is that? Well, suppose, suppose our prime P has K digits. That means that. Um, index of p in the, in the set of primes, in other words, the number of primes up to and including p. Uh, the prime number theorem, it's uh, p over log p. Well, p is near 10 to the k. So this number pi of p is about 10 to the k over k. Uh, what about the product of p's digits? There are k of them. So the product of p's digits is smaller than 9 to the k. Now, as most calculus students can tell you, 10 to the k over k goes to infinity faster than 9 to the k. And so <coughs> two quantities would not be equal once k is big enough. So that's a proof that there are only finitely many. If you work out um, what the crossover is when this starts saying that it can't be, maybe the, um, if you do that the right way, it turns out that uh, you only have to look at primes up to about 10 to the 47. So that's a finite problem. There are only finitely many primes up to 10 to the 47. You just have to enumerate them and you're done. Um, but we didn't do that, um, not that skill in the computation, but we used some other ideas. Um, one of the ideas, well, there's some obvious things that you can use. For example, the prime should not contain a digit zero. Um, obviously, it's in the product of the digits is zero. That wouldn't work. Um, let's see, the number should be seven. The, the, the product of the digits should be seven smooth. Because if you multiply a number with integers between one and nine, you're not going to involve any primes above seven. So um, what if we just looked at that? We just enumerated the seven smooth numbers to 10 to the 45. Yeah. Well, there aren't that many of them. There are, you know, in the multi millions, but something tractable. One could enumerate all these seven smooth numbers up to up to the bound. But once you have a candidate seven smooth number, how do you rule it out or rule it in as a, as one of the, <laughs> these primes? You have to find the prime that corresponds to that index. So I give you some seven smooth number with thirty digits. How do you find the prime if that's n? How do you find p sub n? Well, that seems to be pretty difficult. Well, we, we didn't exactly find it. What we did was we, um, well, we used the prime number theorem. The, uh, the sharpest form of the prime number theorem known is a um, numerically explicit error term. 
and you could back that up. So we could back it up and find the leading digits of our of our p that would have that would be p sub n. And if those leading digits contain a zero, well, it can't be. If the leading digit is two, you can leave it leave it out. As if you reverse a number that starts with two and it ends in two and it's not prime. So various tricks like that we could use, and um, we eventually we were able to use that to show that 73 was the only one. Now, when we wrote up a paper about this that was published in American Math Monthly, um, we wanted to thank people at the show for the problem. Uh, and um, at the end of every show, they have a scientific advisor. His name is uh, David Salzberg. And it turns out David Salzberg is a physics professor at UCLA. And in his spare time, he's the scientific consultant for that show, or was. And so I wrote to him. And first of all, he was sort of a bit blown away that we had proved this theorem. <laughs> and, he, and he said he didn't arrange, uh, uh, the problem didn't come from him, came from the writers of the show. So he told wow. us what the writers were. That's amazing. Thank them. Never heard back from them, but <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, if, if you ever watched that show, The Big Bang Theory, um, it, it, a lot of it takes place in Sheldon's apartment, and in his in his apartment, there are these whiteboards in the background of the of the show that are never quite in focus, but if you sort of don't look at the main characters and just look at the whiteboards, you'll see quite often some math or some physics and things like that. And so in one of the last shows of the final season, Salz Salzburg put on the whiteboard some stuff from our paper. <laughs> so, screenshot. Let's see, so uh, you can see it's not in focus as, as usual. Um, there's, uh, Here's a uh, inequality from a paper of Rutherford and Schoenfeld that pi of x number of primes up to x greater than x over log x for all x greater than or equal to 17. And um, here it is on, on the whiteboard. Um, uh, property. Um, So it was 10 to the 45, not 10 to the 47, because it was full. So, um, that, the, I'm sorry, the sitcoms last, uh, if you take out the commercials, last 22 minutes. So it was my 22 minutes of fame. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Any questions or comments for Carol? Sorry, 